Um, yes, I'm really, um, I'm really glad to be here today and to see that there's really a lot of people listening live um, to the lecture even. And as uh, Maria said, I have a longer experience actually decades uh, of work on Archaea and also on thermophiles and actually my career started by working on thermophiles and um, and I love it a lot and uh, yeah it's one of my favorite topics actually I love it to, to be able to to share this um, this experience with you I would like to touch upon three topics to which I will give you some answers in, in this short time as far as it is possible the first one is what are the environments in which thermophilic organisms reside? What do they look like? Kind of to give you a snapshot of that. And then we will talk about the adaptations of thermophilic organisms. And I'm a biologist. I know you are not all biologists. So there will be maybe some details here and there, but it doesn't matter. I will always bring you back. So don't worry if you are an interdisciplinary person here. I'm used to this in ecology. We are all interdisciplinary. But sometimes I would also love to give you maybe a few biological details. And then third, um, I would like to touch upon the question, what can nowadays thermophiles on Earth actually tell us about the possible origin of life and the temperature of the maybe where the origin came from. And this is a controversial topic and it will unify all the stuff that I brought up in the topic of adaptations of thermophiles. You will see. So three different questions to answer here. And I would like to start with the first one, the environments. Oops, I cannot move on. Let's see to the next slide. Yes, you see it now, I hope. This is an old picture of actually Wolfram Zillig, one of the pioneers, as was already mentioned who used to go to Iceland. He knew Iceland really well. And he sampled a lot of these big ponds, these big terrestrial muddy ponds that you can find in Iceland. And they teem with diversity. There's such a big diversity of thermophiles actually um, in those ponds. And the, um, um, the density of the organisms that live in these ponds is much higher than what you would find in ocean water. In, at least in some places. So back then Wolfram uh, used to bring also microscope into the field and he could directly do microscopy and, and so on. And it was uh, clear that a lot of these ponds are really highly active. I also had the fun to go with him on expeditions. This is me on the left corner, on the left upper corner of the picture. And even further up is Wolfram again. And we are on Mount Yo in Northern Japan here, very sulfuric, as you can see. I think it was a little bit dangerous when we did this trip. You see another one here, terrestrial spring in um, in New Zealand, and I will come back to uh, showing you a little bit what is inside these uh, terrestrial hot springs. So this is the terrestrial part, then you also know that there are hot vents, I'm sure you know this of course, um, the hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean, and we will also touch upon this when we come to the upper limit of life, right? Uh, this is where the hottest organisms have been isolated from. So when you think about it, there's a lot of different possibilities of hot springs that you can find. It's volcanoes, sulfur terrace is where you have the sulfuric areas and terrestrial hot springs, mud volcanoes, geysers, hydrothermal vents, and so on. And when you look at the map, and now this is more a little bit geology, if you want, there are a lot of places where we have the, the opportunity to sample from, right? This is all where you also find earthquakes and these are the places uh, where the tectonic plates are either moving one on top of the other as is the case here in the ring of fire right here east of japan and russia and then down here um, the whole very active volcanic area and also where you have tectonic plates that spread out like in the mid-atlantic ridge right so you this is uh, typical places where you find hot springs, and you can see that in Southern Europe also, there's a lot of opportunities. We go regularly with students also to Southern Italy to sample. But my best place was Kamchatka, this uh, peninsula in the very east of Russia, actually, some time ago when we went there. So these are um, all possible places, a lot of diversity. One could talk forever about the question if there are different hotspots for certain organisms or if even some of these hot springs actually are shared or are inhabited by the same organisms. And this is the case, and we could come back to this in the discussion even um, a little bit. So what is uh, in a terrestrial hot spring? This is what I know mostly from sampling. I've never been in the deep ocean. But what, what you find there in those terrestrial springs, like here, for example, in on, uh, White Island, 
um, in New Zealand, um, it has been measured. So you find a lot of CO2, um, of course, coming out. So all these gases, sulfuric gases, and you know, you have elemental sulfur, you have hydrogen, and you have nitrogen. And it was recognized relatively early um, that it was recognized relatively early that a lot of the organisms take their energy from hydrogen, like in the hydrothermal vents, essentially. So they are not dependent on phototrophic organisms, but they are the primary producers or the thermophiles that are the primary producers often, not only, but often use hydrogen as an energy source. And um, and this is also shown here. So here's Karl Stetter, really the pioneer of the uh, hottest organisms that have been isolated, if you want. So there's a lot of organisms that oxidize hydrogen and um, take as an electron acceptor different kinds of other gases or minerals or yeah, sulfuric compounds or nitrate or oxygen or CO2, where they put uh, in, at the end the electrons on. And this is the redox reaction from which they are able to gain energy to build up biomass. But in these hot springs, you also have more of a food chain. You also have not only the primary producers, but also organisms that then consume degraded biomass that has been built up from the primary producers, of course. And here you also see the plantation plant. I took this from a review that uh, Stetter once wrote in 2006. So he has these big, very famous fermenters that are titanium coated so that they can withstand all this corrosive material that is produced from these hyperthermophiles that uh, they are growing there also in large biomass. So Karl Stetter is very well known or was very well known in the field and is, still is because he was also supplying biomass for people to actually study these organisms. All okay? I hear noise in the background. Um, so is life possible above 100 degrees? Maybe we go to the upper temperature limit now. Yes, it is. I'm sure you know about that. And where do you find those organisms most easily? You find them, of course, in underwater situations where water is not evaporated at 100 degrees. You can also find them from from terrestrial hot springs occasionally. But here, for example, it's only in 10 meter depths. Uh, we went diving uh, off the shore of the Azores, for example, and you find those bubbling hot springs ga gases coming up from the seafloor, which you, then you can identify as actually being hot springs. And you can measure up to 100 degrees if you stick in even a short thermometer. And you can sample also those places. And you can actually find organisms like, like Hypothermus botulicus, which was isolated from there from Wolfram Zilix lab, which grows up to 108 degrees, so already above 100 degrees Celsius. It's a butyrate producer. And yeah, and here also you see a cell. We haven't shown any cells yet. I actually don't have many slides about cells. These are microorganisms. This is an archaeon. This has already been mentioned. Archaea and bacteria can live at high temperatures, but the record holders, we will come to that, are archaea, and they look like microorganisms. They are a micrometer in size about. They are cocoid shaped. They have very interesting cell walls. You can see it here. It looks like a net, very stable cell walls. And you can also have rod shaped organisms. And this is about it. Microorganisms are not fascinating because of their cell shape necessarily, but mostly because of their adaptations and their metabolisms. And yeah, this is definitely also the case for thermophiles. So here's another one, Pyrodictium occultum, which makes this interesting net in which you find the cell bodies. There are two cell bodies to be seen here in this scanning electron micrograph, and they built up this huge net, actually, in which they are entangled. And this also comes from a shallow place, actually, Volcano Island in uh, Italy, uh, where you can find also um, hot places. But then, of course, if you if you go to the very, you know, to the hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean, there you have also, of course, very interesting places to sample from and to find um, hyperthermophiles. Here you see the arm from one of those robots sampling. You see, you can see some sort of shrimps and, and other organisms growing on top of it. And um, to look more carefully into the situation, what what is a hydrothermal vent? I'm sorry, this is a little bit unsharp, unfortunately. So here you see this um, this this hot um, this black smoker, yeah, the typical black smoker. And what happens is that actually seawater is sucked into the ground, you know, and then it is heated up by 
coming closer to the magma chamber or something deeper in the in, in the mantle and then it actually comes up again with a lot of dissolved uh, material and then it comes into contact with the seawater which is extremely cold and and oxygenated and so on and then you have a lot of precipitation of material and minerals and then you build up these black smokers that don't have such a long lifetime they live maybe about 20 years and they degrade again and and you know that these have been, I guess many of you know, these have been places of intense research and the hottest organisms have been sampled from there. So we have a gradient of maybe 350 degrees Celsius in the inner, and there's a thin wall and outside you have the cold seawater of two degrees Celsius. So it's a steep gradient of temperature. And when we want to discuss the upper temperature of life or yeah, for different organism classes, we are talking about um, not where we find them, how hot the place was, but really has it been shown that an organism is dividing, that an organism is growing. So let's look at the world of organisms to uh, discuss the upper temperature limit. So here's a few examples for animals, you know, fish and other um, aquatic vertebrates, maybe up to 38 degrees Celsius. And then you have insects, you have the Sahara desert spider, you know, up to 55 degrees Celsius. You have crustaceans, the crustaceae, I don't know, uh, that grow up to 50 degrees maybe. And then there's this famous worm, Alvinella pompeiana, which is said to be able to live at 80 degrees Celsius. I'm not exactly sure if this has really been proven, but the name is so beautiful. And here's the worm. It is named after Alvin, the, you know, the, the submarine that has been used to sample actually, and after Pompeiana, because it lives at the foot of these underwater volcanic situations like people in Pompeii uh, lived. Uh, in southern Italy. So, and here you see a typical rift here tube worm. I guess you know it builds its, its biomass with the help of microorganisms in its tubes. These are also typical inhabitants on the outside of hot vents of, uh, of hydrothermal vents. So then let's go to other classes. We have plants also, sorry, this was not translated. So we have the higher plants with like up to 45 degrees, mosses up to 50 degrees. And then we have eukaryotic microorganisms that have been found to live above, a little bit above 60 degrees. And this is very interesting. We will talk more about this kind of switch maybe that happens above 60, 65 degrees Celsius. Because when we look into the microbial world, we really see that then it becomes more stringent for the organisms. Above 65 or so, there's really a change in the adaptations. So these fungi grow up to yeah, over 60 degrees even. And I know well that Karl Stetter has looked a lot for eukaryotic microorganisms to be able to thrive at temperatures, maybe at 80 degrees, like microorganisms, and he never found them. And there is a nice theory about why that could be, and I will come to this later, or you can ask me later in case I forget to refer to the idea why we think that eukaryotic organisms, these are all eukaryotic organisms listed here, why they might not be able to sustain life higher than maybe 65 or so. Um, and these eukaryotic organisms, as you know, they have a cellular nucleus where they store the genetic material. They have compartments inside the cell, very different from bacteria and archaea, which have only one compartment to nowadays understanding. And I think it's pretty much mostly true. And, um, and here we find the higher, the organisms that can sustain life at higher temperatures. So in the bacterial world, you can see here you have phototrophs up to maybe 74 degrees Celsius. And then you have aquifex, one of the really hot ones at 95. And you have some like geothermobacterium very reducens up to 100 degrees. So this is the, really the maximum temperature. It's not the optimal, but the maximum. And in the archaea, we have some of the record holders here. In the current debated, uh, discussed upper temperature that has been shown by organisms are really dividing is around 121 or 122 degrees Celsius. And um, it's a funny debate between this one degree Celsius difference because apparently not many people have been able to, um, to keep up with this temperature of 122. So some something that it's 121. So there's really a race for the upper temperature. The general understanding in the community is that probably temperatures could go up maybe 250 or so, but then the biochemists start to doubt that 
proteins, you know, with iron sulfur centers and so on, complex proteins in our cells would not be able to, to be stable enough. So that's maybe the upper limit, but of course we don't know. We can only show what, what has been cultivated. So here's strain, famous strain 121, and I'm sure it was called like this because uh, that is the temperature of the autoclave. That's the temperature that is used to sterilize material in the laboratory and also in medical uh, work. Yeah, you can, uh, under pressure, you sterilize your material, but this is actually a temperature where life has been shown that an organism can divide. And you see such a growth curve here in the, and the, the minimum of this curve shows where it grows fastest. So it grows fastest above 100 degrees and goes up to 121. And I show you another uh, original, you know, publication, just a, an idea, you know, what does it look like? So this is maybe the record holder, Kentakai, famous person to work on hyperthermophiles in Japan. And here you can see how different they grow. So these are growth curves like cell counts, you know, how they go up when they are at the optimum here at around 100 degrees. And then you have to apply pressure, of course, to go above 100 degrees. And you see, of course, they grow more slowly. And um, and uh, and you can also do this in dependence of pressure and so on. And you see different behavior, but clearly, um, if the temperature measurement was correct, then this was 122 degrees from this from this literature. So with that, let's go to some more fundamentals about what is actually a, a thermophile. How do we? What do we call a thermophile, and what do we call a hyperthermophile? and extremely thermophile. So um, here you see growth curves of examples of microorganisms and you see their optimum. And then you see the breadth, the temperature span in which they can actually grow. And you see a cold organism called a psychrophile that is really adapted to the cold, has a certain span in which it can divide, in which it can grow and an optimum like all the others as well. And what this tells you is you see that there's a window of growth for each of these organisms, which means that a thermophile, like for example, Bacillus sterile thermophilus, 60 degrees, has also only a certain window. It's not growing at lower temperature. So these organisms are adapted to a certain window size of temperature. And this is what I would like to show you with these pictures. And uh, with this picture, and the same is true for the really high temperature organisms like Pyrolobus fumari, for example, 106 degrees optimum, and you also have a certain window. So they actually experience a cold shock at 80, right? So they are really adapted to high temperature only. They are not able to function at lower temperature. And Karl Stetter um, defined somewhat in one paper that we call a hyperthermophile, all those organisms that grow optimally above 80 degrees. It's one of the definitions that you can find in the literature. Whereas the term extreme thermophile is used in general for like kind of the upper temperatures. And from the literature, I think uh, what we see and we will discuss it and I've mentioned it already, we have a certain split here between uh, from 65 degrees on because here these organisms have really very special adaptations and, and I will come to that. So, so here we are talking about bacteria and archaea. And you have seen probably different trees maybe before, phylogenetic trees. So the idea, the current idea is that there was a last universal common ancestor. No doubt about that, because all organisms on Earth that we know of share so many similarities in their central metabolism. And then we have an early split into this lineage of bacteria and then this lineage of archaea and later the um, the complex organisms, the eukaryotes. And you can see that there is a lot of hot lineages in red, lineages of thermophiles and extreme thermophiles that seem to branch off closer to like the origin of life kind of here. And this is one of the ideas um, why, why several researchers and for a long time it has been propagated that life might have come from a hot origin. And this is what I will touch upon later in this talk why this is also doubted and uh, yeah we will come to this but first of all here you see there are two big groups bacteria and archaea and both groups actually have thermophiles or even hyperthermophiles and let's compare the bacteria and the archaea before i come to their cellular differences somebody has made a compilation valentine in 2006 i think in uh, 
where he put in from the literature all the optima for pH and temperature that you can find. And in pink, you see the archaea. So this is a temperature and pH optimum of an archaea. And here's one, each dot is an organism. And you can see that archaea are actually dominating at higher temperature. There's most organisms that have been cultivated at the highest temperatures are actually archaea and they are also the record holders. Bacteria come up to 80 degrees, we said. Actually, we said above 95, it's not mentioned here. And what I would like to show here too is that the adaptation to high temperature often also means that the adaptation to low pH, to, to, to acids. And this is probably also a little bit biased maybe, I'm not sure, but because often um, organisms have been sampled from acidic springs. So look at these guys here, they all grow at high temperature and low pH. And in these acidic springs, you have sulfur compounds that are being oxidized and you get sulfuric acid, of course, and this is very acidic. And you can tell when you go um, to hot springs in Iceland, you see a lot of different hot springs and those that have sulfuric compounds are muddy and, and look very different from those that are neutral in pH. And you can already see from before, you know what you expect and, uh, the, and you find a lot of sulfur dependent organisms, for example. So yeah, so you can see here that archaea apparently have cell structures that make them more adaptable to hot temperature, or is it where they originated from? Who knows? But um, for sure, archaea must have adaptations that make them most suitable to live at high temperature. And this is what we are going to look at now, at the hottest, if you want, and, and also at, at the thermophiles. So what are the adaptations? This is my second topic now. What are the adaptations of uh, thermophiles? And when we ask that question, we have to ask, uh, what is in a cell? What are the macromolecules in a cell? And how are these made thermostable? This is the biggest question, actually. That's it. And this is what we will cover now. It's mostly like three different topics. It's the cell wall and the cell membrane. We will actually talk mostly about the cell membrane today. Cell walls are very diverse. And then we will talk about proteins briefly, and then we will talk about nucleic acids, the genetic material. This is the three major you know, compounds in a cell, and they all need to be thermoadapted, right? They all need to be thermostable. Mm -hmm. So you might have heard, um, you might have heard about the different lipids of archaea as, as opposed to bacteria and eukaryotes. On the top here, you see a typical membrane lipid of bacteria and all higher eukaryotic organisms, all complex eukaryotes. They all share the same membrane type, which is a glycerol, chemically a glycerol moiety. And then there's an ester linkage because a fatty acid has been linked to, to um, the OH group here, to the glycerol moiety, and you have an ester link, and then you have a fatty acid side chain. That's the basic compound. In archaea, this is fundamentally different. And this is very astonishing and very interesting. It's called the lipid divide. We have two different types of lipids. And when you look at all archaea that are known, it's very amazing that this is the only biochemical feature that unifies all archaea to the exclusion of all other organisms on Earth. This is the biomarker for archaea. And this means that also archaea who live at 20 degrees and 30 degrees in the ocean, you know, a lot of archaea actually live in our commonplace environments, also in and on our human body, they also have these lipids. So it's not that these organisms that live at high temperatures have only these lipids, but also all other archaea. And what they have is they have an ether bond here, an ether bond. Um, from a phytanyl side chain, which means that the side chain is not a fatty acid, but it is branched. You see the carbon chain here, but it's actually branched from an isoprenoid derivative, and it is connected by an ether lipid, by an ether bondage. And this makes them intrinsically more stable. There are a few more other specific features. One, one more we have to learn because it's also very fundamental and very um, Fascinating. So this is the diether because usually you have two side chains linked to a glycerol and the archaea can make a deglycerol tetraether, which means they can, they don't have a bilayer, but they actually make a monolayer. They connect the membrane. Usually it is a bilayer, but they connect it to a monolayer on both sides of the membrane, which is unusual and also a, a specific feature of, of archaea. 
And this makes the membrane look much different from regular membranes. I'm sorry, I didn't put a regular membrane where you have a B layer normally, which, which uh, where the lipophilic ends of these membrane lipids are actually just uh, coming towards each other, but here they are covalently linked. So this is really a membrane monolayer, and here you have a protein that is spanning this lipid monolayer. So this, of course, makes this intrinsically a very stable compound. I would like to, for the, for the people who are more in the molecular field or, or chemists or biologists, I would like to give, draw your attention to some more diversity. And uh, just to tell you that this is not the whole uh, simple story. So here on the left side, you see all kinds of lipids from Archaea, but they are all variants of what I told you. They all have ether linkages to the glycerol, and they all have these uh, side chains, which are phytonyl derivatives. Sometimes they make some other games, like here they are connected. Some are unsaturated with double bonds. Some have also like these pentanyl rings in it that kinks the membrane a little bit, which is actually a sign for very high temperature organisms. And on the right side, you see all kinds of variants of lipids from bacteria, from strange bacteria, exceptions, from the rule and, se and several of them are actually thermophiles. And they also sometimes form an ether bond. Sometimes they have a branched side chain, but not as regular, not as extensive as the archaea. So this is like an analogy in, in evolution, if you want. They form sort of lipids that are apparently also more stable. So here, up here, you see an ether bond also in the bacteria one, just to tell you that this is also exists, but they look still different from the typical archaea lipids. Okay, that was the membrane. So the membrane intrinsically in evolution for these archaea has developed such that it can also be very stable at high temperature, obviously. How is it with the proteins? So here you see um, um, a picture of from structural analysis of um, a protein that is very similar in a mesophile. These are the organisms at moderate temperature and a thermophile. And in color, in blue and red, you see um, you see polar amino acids. And so when crystal structures came into play to find out what makes proteins thermostable it was kind of a surprise. All of a sudden, it was seen that the proteins are often outside of the protein. They are often loaded with these charged amino acids. And this is why they can build salt bridges and they, uh, yeah, and they can connect and they make this ionic net around the protein. And this is certainly one way of, um, of making proteins more stable. There are other factors um, that also play a role. And I just list them here so that you have heard about it. So these are the proteins of a thermophile, when you compare to a close relative, this is done here, um, they also have a reduced water content just by having more hydrophobic uh, amino acids inside their proteins. And they are more compact. This cannot be seen on this picture, but often proteins have extensions, you know, for interactions with other proteins because these are our catalytic machines in the cell, right? So we have many variants and so on. And some interact with others, of course, and and uh, you can see this trend when you see the three D structure of uh, of proteins of thermophiles that they are more compact, of of course, because it makes them um, less uh, how to say less sensitive towards temperature, right? So these are typical features of proteins. So each protein in an organism, of course, needs to be adapted to high temperature if it becomes a thermophile in the course of evolution, or if it, if it is a thermophile, let's say it like this. So now we have, uh, we have the, the third group. This was the proteins. To give you an idea, the third group is the nucleic acids, the DNA, the Watson-Crick helix, and the RNA, which is also nucleic acids. So the DNA, the genetic material, you know that this is a, a helix and that it is built um, with um, bases here, the A and T base pairing and the G, C base pairing. And maybe you also know that the one has two um, uh, hydrogen bonds here in between and the other one has three. And so you would guess probably that if an organism grows at higher temperature, it should have more G, C content because it makes it intrinsically a more stable DNA double helix. And this is correct, but this is only correct for the lower temperature range. This is correct for organisms maybe up to 60 degrees Celsius. They definitely 
uh, you can show that. So these are organisms also that grow in your compost or so in, in some, for me, it's a moderate thermophilic situation. When you come to higher temperatures, to organisms that grow at 80 degrees and 100 degrees, this doesn't work anymore. And they often have a low GC content and they have other tricks to make their uh, DNA stable. And this is listed here. And I start with the lower one. This is DNA binding proteins. There's a huge diversity of DNA binding proteins that sit on the helix and make and stabilize it. A, a lot of different kinds have been evolved in the different organisms. And then they have some interesting phenomenon, and this is the reverse gyrase. This is very unusual. This protein only occurs with one exception. It only occurs in organisms that grow optimally above 65 degrees Celsius. They have this reverse gyrase, which means they can twist the DNA Watson Crick helix in the direction of its natural helical structure and, and super twist it to a so-called positive supercoil. All other organisms on Earth have a negatively supercoil DNA. But um, but these archaea can also make positive supercoil uh, extensively. Um, but the conundrum is that you cannot show in vitro that this positive supercoil DNA is more thermostable. This is not the case. It's more difficult than that. But this is the phenomenon that one can see that they have reverse gyrase to introduce positive supercoils. And it has shown that they also can have positive supercoils. So obviously there's a problem about six five degrees Celsius. I already mentioned that. Maybe another problem. Maybe now we come to the most sensitive molecules in the cell. It's so easily adapted. And this is the RNA. So the molecules that are transcribed that are copied from DNA. And RNA is, as you know, the template for the protein biosynthesis machinery. But also we have stable RNAs in our cells. So the ribosomes that actually synthesize proteins consist mostly of RNA, right? And then we also have tRNAs for translation into proteins, which are also stable RNAs. They need to survive for a long time in the cell in order to be able to work. And these stable RNAs in hyperthermophiles are heavily modified. It's really impressive. So it has first been shown, I think, by Methanococcus for Methanococcus yanashii, one of the hyperthermophiles early on. You see here, this is like a piece if you want of an RNA, and this is supposed to be uh, uh, one of the bases here, but it's actually so heavily modified, you don't have the, the basic rings anymore of pyrimidines and purines, you have like a three ring system here. So there is big enzymatic machineries to make actually these modifications of the base pairs that we usually don't see in RNA, uh, not this extensively and uh, at least not this extensively. And you can show that if you grow hyperthermophiles at different temperatures, they have more modifications the higher you grow them. So it's clear that there's an, a, a sensitive point in the RNA and that in certain areas of these stable, so-called stable RNAs that need to be maintained in the cell, uh, there is a serious structural problem if you want. And so, um, and this is actually uh, very interesting. And, and then we have another problem, uh, which I didn't mention in the beginning, but I would also like to tell you that it's a challenge for the organisms, not only to maintain these three groups of um, macromolecules, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, but also they make metabolism, they convert you know, chemical compounds from one into the other, right? For example, when they degrade sugar, you, they use, uh, like other organisms, maybe the emden meyer hoff panas pathway, the glycolysis from fructose B-phosphate to glycerin aldehyde phosphate to D-phosphoglycerate and so on. You know, they degrade to, down to pyruvate, classical degradation pathway. But in hyperthermophiles, there is a problem, and this has been shown a bit, but it's too little investigated. Some of these compounds have such a short half-life at high temperature. At 60 degrees already, this intermediate has a very short half-life compared to other compounds. And so you can see which are the sensitive points. And concomitant with this, very interestingly, for example, the organism Sulfurobus sulfatericus, um, it avoids this compound. It has an enzyme that directly converts GAP to 3PG and avoids those sensitive, you know, black holes of the metabolism, it has also been termed, uh, because they are probably too short-lived. And this is, of course, a problem. So either you have very fast metabolism or you protect your compounds, or maybe you avoid, as you do here. There are also different pathways, but this is 
not so important now. You can see that the carrier of energy in organisms, ATP, has quite a good half-life, actually. It's actually quite stable. 115 minutes at 90 degrees is really a long time. Yeah? So, But other substrates, other metabolites are really sensitive. So that's a problem. Yeah. And with that, so we have covered now the adaptations. And with that, I come to the last part. Um, it's not very long, but it is about the discussion. What, what do these hypothermophiles teach us about maybe the origin of life? Yeah, so this is a very attractive idea that the last universal common ancestor was maybe a hypothermophile. Why? Because of several reasons. One is that thermodynamically, you would expect this is great to get energy, right, from a hot vent. And um, you can imagine that chemistry occurs more easily. And also you have this great, these great rocks. And there is this great uh, idea from Bill Martin and others that have tried to explain maybe how the first cells came about and to explain the different lipid uh, membrane also. So you could think of a, you know, like pirate-like uh, whatever um, um, uh, structure on the bottom of the ocean, nice and hot, and then life arises here together because we have so many commonalities also, and then maybe you have some compartments um, in these holes in the rock, you know, that make up an archaeon with a different lipid than the ones from bacteria. That's um, an interesting and nice uh, hypothesis, and it has always been promoted uh, also because it's attractive to think that the last un universal common ancestor was hot. And I have shown this before, there are phylogenetic trees showing that hypothermophiles tend to branch off at the, at the root, maybe of the, um, um, yeah, at the beginning, at LUCA, you know, so that LUCA then by, by inference would also, could also have been a hypothermophile. However, there's a bias. You have learned that there's a bias. These trees are based on ribosomal RNA, on certain proteins. And, and you have just seen now that organisms that grow at high temperature are heavily adapted. And you can also be wrong with this phylogenetic calculations. Maybe these organisms do not branch if, at the very root of this tree. And this is indeed what was found. So one point why this has been doubted is that in the bacterial branches, Thermotogalis, Aquificalis, are not always branching at the very origin, you know, towards Archaea. So they're not the deepest branching organisms. In this phylogeny, for example, here uh, by Céline Brochier, from which I also have these slides on the origin um, of life, uh, you have Planctomycetalis branching deeper in the bacteria and not the hot organisms. Yeah, so they actually seem to arise here um, uh, within the bacterial branch. So this has been doubted that the phylogeny, the deep branching of hypothermophiles is not really well represented if you base it on ribosomal RNA and others. And the other interesting phenomenon is that we have this reverse gyrase I mentioned that makes this positive supercoil that we find in all hypothermophiles. So if archaea and bacteria have a reverse gyrase and they do, then you would expect that it was also in the last universal common ancestor. And so then this reverse gyrus um, must be important for survival at really high temperature, right? So that would be a reasoning. However, it has been shown that the reverse gyrus of bacteria has been taken over from archaea. It was a so-called horizontal gene transfer and evolution. One can show this by phylogenetic trees that the bacteria who have reverse gyrus are actually branching if you make a phylogenetic tree with the reverse gyrus inside the archaea. So it's a very good evidence that it was a ho horizontal gene transfer from archaea to bacteria. And this happens often in the microbial world. It's not so unusual that these things happen. And so this speaks against the fact that the last universal common ancestor must have had a, um, a reverse gyrus, right? because it was later transferred to bacteria. That's the idea. And then my last point, and that's actually approaching my last slide. Uh, I, I remind you of these heavy uh, modifications that I've already shown you on the RNA, which show that the RNA is the most sensitive point, maybe in the cell, or one of the most sensitive points. And it's hard to imagine, at least from what we know nowadays, from organisms growing at high temperature, at 80 degrees and higher, it's hard to imagine um, how they can have life as it is known now with DNA and RNA 
if the organisms that we look at have these heavy modifications. So then I come to my conclusions. So hot springs worldwide teem with microbial life. They are really um, crowded with microbial life. The current upper temperature limit based on growth of microorganisms is at around 122 degrees Celsius. Hyperthermophiles have sophisticated adaptations, in particular to stabilize their nucleic acids, but also all compounds. And my personal um, opinion, not only mine, but mine is that it seems improbable rather that life arose at temperatures above 65, but moderately hot could well be a temperature from which they came. And with that, I would like to end and I'm very happy to take your questions. <laughs>